This video will discuss the OSPF routing protocol or Open Shortest Path First protocol. OSPF is a link state interior gateway protocol. This is the one link state routing protocol that we will learn about in this curriculum. The other routing protocols that we learned about such as RIP, Ripping, and EIGRP are considered distance vector routing protocols. As I mentioned, OSPF stands for Open Shortest Path First. It's an open protocol, which means it's not proprietary from Cisco and any brand of router can use the OSPF protocol. It's a very common protocol out in the industry and it's used very frequently. There are different versions of OSPF, but what we will learn about in this class is OSPF v2, which is the latest for IP version 4, and OSPF v3, which is the latest for IP version 6. OSPF has an administrative distance of 110, which is slightly better than RIPs of 120, but not quite as good as our EIGRP, which is 90, or our static routes that we learned about, which are 1s. A guy by the name of Edgar Dijkstra developed Dijkstra's algorithm that's used to calculate the routes for OSPF. OSPF has many features and it makes it appealing to use as a routing protocol. One of the features is that it's classless, what we mean by this is that it supports variable length subnet mask and CIDR. It's very efficient compared to RIP, for example. Routing changes trigger routing updates. There's no periodic updates. We don't send entire routing tables every 30 seconds like we do with RIP. Uh, we have faster convergence. Uh, because of this, we can quickly propagate network changes to all other routers in uh, the OSPF domain. That's very scalable. It works well in smart, small and large network sizes. Uh, routers can also be grouped into areas to support a hierarchical system. It's considered more secure because it supports MD5 authentication. And as I mentioned before, it has the administrative distance of 110. Since we learned about RIP already, I'd like to compare and contrast OSPF to RIP. Uh, OSPF will converge faster compared to RIP. RIP has to send all RIP has to send its entire routing table every 30 seconds to all other routers in order for the convergence to happen. Whereas with OSPF, if a link change has been detected, that immediately gets flooded to all other routers and they make the appropriate change. There is no hop count limitation with OSPF like there was with RIP. Uh, with RIP, there was a maximum of 15 hop counts. So this makes it more scalable for us. OSPF uses a cost, giving us better values to faster links. With RIPs, all we, were, all we were concerned about was how many hops away, or how many routers away are we to that destination. It didn't matter if the links that we were going over to get to that destination were slow 56k dial-up connections or what they were, um, as long as the hops that it took to get there were short. Whereas with OSPF, we take a look at the speed of the links. If it takes us one extra hop, but we can go over gigabit per second ethernet connections, we will choose that route instead. So we're more concerned about speed here with OSPF than we are concerned with distance or how many hops away we are. With OSPF, we send our routing updates to a multicast address. Uh, RIP version two did this, but RIP version one did not. It does support the variable length subnet mask. Uh, we can group our routers into areas um, which is an advantage for us because now routers in an area only have to keep track of databases and routing information for their area and not the whole entire uh, topology. And it has a better administrative distance of the 110 versus the 120. So if there were two ways to get to a destination and one way was over an OSPF route, and the other way was over a RIP route, we would choose the OSPF way because it has a better administrative distance. OSPF keeps track of many different databases and tables, and this makes it a little bit more complex uh, than our RIP protocol that we learned before. Some of the databases and tables that you need to know about are the adjacency database. This is our neighbor table. This lists all of the neighbors to which a router has established bi-directional communication. This table is going to be unique for every router because every router in an OSPF domain will have different co directly connected neighbors. If you want to view your neighbors, you can do a show IP OSPF neighbor command. We have our link state database, which is our topology table. This lists information about all other routers in the network. 
this database is going to be the same for every single router in the OSPF domain. If you want to view this, you can do the show IP OSPF uh, database. Then we have our forwarding database or our routing table. And we're familiar with our routing table from our other routing protocols. This lists the routes that we take to get to our destinations. The routing table is going to be unique for each router in the topology and the fact that they all will have different routes to get to different networks. But all of the networks that are listed in the routing table should be the same for every router as they should be converged. If you want to view your routing table, you use the show IP route command, just like we did for all of our other routing protocols. OSPF does not send its entire routing table on a periodic basis like RIP did. RIP would send its entire routing table every 30 seconds. OSPF instead only sends the changes and only those changes when it needs to, and that's when it detects a link change. What OSPF does send on a periodic basis are hello messages, and these hello messages are going to be sent either every 10 seconds or every 30 seconds, depending on the type of network segment that we're on. Hello messages are going to be used to form adjacencies, and they will also be used in our DR and BDR elections that we'll talk about coming up. The dead interval is four times the hello interval. So if we had a hello interval of 10 seconds, our dead interval would be 40 seconds. If we do not receive a hello message from our neighbor in 40 seconds, we consider that neighbor down or dead, and we will start to remove them from our tables and databases that we have for OSPF. Please note that in order for routers to become adjacent, their hello intervals and dead intervals must match. I've mentioned OSPF areas a few times, and in this class we will just talk about single area OSPF, which will always be area zero for us because we must have area zero. But as you progress through the CCNA curriculum, you learn about multiple area OSPF. Routers only need to keep databases for the area, for the area in which they are in. This has several advantages. This leads to smaller routing tables. It reduces the link state update overhead as we only have to process and store updates from a smaller amount of routers. And it reduces the frequency of our shortest path first calculations. So dividing our OSPF routers into multiple areas can become a big advantage for us. This slide here shows an example of a single area OSPF model and a multiple area OSPF model. As I said before, we must have an area zero and this is also known as the backbone area. A single area OSPF is use, useful in small networks where we have few routers and you want to utilize the OSPF routing protocol. With multiple area OSPF, we have that backbone area, area zero, that connects multiple areas together. The interconnecting routers that connect the areas together are known as area border routers. This is useful in larger network deployments to reduce processing and memory overhead. In that example there, in area 51, only those four routers plus R2 would have to keep track of that area. All of those routers would have identical topology tables very similar routing tables and the fact that they have the same networks and they would not have to have any knowledge of R1 or any of the routers that are that are in area 1. They only have to keep track of what is in area 51. That's all for this particular slideshow on the OSPF characteristics. However, I do have a few other slideshows and videos that go through how the OSPF process works and how OSPF is configured and maintained on a Cisco router. I encourage you to watch through those other videos as well. Thanks for watching.